So I'd like to thank uh, Benny and Yossi for this invitation. It's a pleasure for me uh, being here and giving this talk. As, uh, as Benny said, this is uh, part of, uh, let's say it's an excerpt of a larger tutorial that I and my colleague uh, Fabio Roli um, had um, in, some, uh, in some conference last year. And um, I, there is also a paper associated with this tutorial wh whose title is uh, just the title of, of this talk. So if you're interested in knowing more about these uh, topics, you can refer to that paper as well. And um, yeah. The, I'd like to start by pointing out, uh, by quoting this sentence from Andrew Ng, who is a prominent researcher in the area of AI and machine learning. Uh, where he defined that AI is the new electricity uh, for, for, for businesses and, and applications nowadays. And we have uh, recorded a lot of success in uh, different application areas like uh, cybersecurity, robotics, healthcare. We have cars that can see the world around them so they can recognize other cars, pedestrians, stop signs, this kind of traffic signs in general, these kind of things, right? We have uh, assistants uh, on our phones, like we have uh, Amazon Alexa, you know Siri, you know all the other ones, right? And everything seems to work uh, perfectly fine <laughs> in these in this benign settings, right? So the main questions uh, we've been addressing even before deep learning uh, showed up was about uh, what about the security of these techniques, right? Or about security of machine learning in general. Now, one may think that this area uh, was born in 2013 or 14 with the advent of deep learning and this phenomenon of adversarial examples. Whereas, uh, personally, I started working on this topic back into 2007-8, where I was doing my PhD. And the very first paper dates back to 2004 uh, with an application of uh, trying to bypass um, spam filters uh, out using text classifiers. So this dates back much, much earlier than um, 2013 or 14. And in this tutorial, I'll try to uh, bridge this gap between these two apparently different areas of, of research. I mean, adversarial machine learning and the security of deep learning, okay? Well, we, we were speaking about, so what, what about the security of AI? And uh, there are several examples nowadays that have shown that you can actually fool these systems with also uh, physical and practical examples. One popular one is this uh, uh, modified stop sign. So on your left you see a stop sign with some stickers and on the right you see a clean stop sign. And the video shows a car that tries to recognize this stop sign as it proceeds, as it approaches it. And uh, as you will see, as you can see now running the video on the left, uh, there is an incorrect prediction. So the stop sign is recognized as a speed limit for most of the frames that are acquired, while on the right, the prediction is correct, right? Uh, this is one example uh, of how you can fool this kind of algorithm for recognition. So the stickers that are applied to the stop sign are not put there at random. There is a specific noise which is crafted to mislead the learning algorithm, and we will discuss how this noise is, is, is designed okay, on, on for this purpose. Another example was shown in uh, uh, face recognition. So where this uh, gentleman and his co-authors show that if you wear these strange eyeglass uh, frames, uh, the algorithm recognizes you as Mila Jovovich. Okay, so she's a very famous actor. So this is, I think this is a big mistake, right? Uh, there is another, another popular example is that uh, you can fabricate also 3D objects which are misrecognized by um, these deep learning based computer vision systems. In this example, these researchers from MIT have shown that if you uh, design this 3D purple, uh, this, the 3D turtle, initially it's correctly recognized. But now if you craft a strange uh, color pattern on this, on this sample, uh, this is a modified turtle which is uh, misclassified as a rifle consistently from different angles, poses, rotations, and so on, okay? And this is shown in the video, it's quite clear. Now, having a turtle which is misclassified as a rifle is not a big problem. The problem is if you have a rifle which is misclassified as a turtle, right? Uh, 
And uh, those are mostly examples in the computer vision domain, but there are other application areas where you can have also other, other nice examples. Uh, a very popular one by Nicolas Carlini is in the field of uh, audio examples, where he showed that you can actually fool this voice assistant that I was mentioning before. For example, in this case, uh, I will just play an audio uh, from one of the, these examples that Nicolas put online. And you will hear that the audio is clean and Mozilla DeepSpeech translates it correctly. So the text-to-speech translation works perfectly fine in the first case. Without the data set, the article is useless. Okay, that's the original sound and this is the translation. And now what I will play is an adversarial example where you, you can hear just a little bit of background noise, but as humans we can still get the same message. And then I will show how this is translated. Without the data set, the article is useless. You see, it seems the same, but there is a little background noise if you, if you pay attention. And the translation is, okay, Google, browse to evil.com. And in this case, you can actually decide uh, whichever sentence you would like to, to get out of this audio, okay, based on the noise that you add. So it's completely uh, on the end of, or in the end of the attacker. We did also another example, and I think also Benny have a, probably a similar paper on this, where we showed that you can also fool um, convolutional neural networks or deep learning in general when it learns from uh, raw data, um, from, raw, from binary data. So you, it, the input data here is a sequence of bytes that composes a file, and the purpose is to discriminate uh, benign from computer viruses, so benign data from malware samples. Uh, there is this network which is called Malconf, which basically learns from these input bytes uh, to distinguish between these two classes, and it works fairly well on, on, on some, some reasonable data sets. What we've shown is that if you carefully select some uh, padding bytes that you can add at the end of the file, you can just evade it with a very, very large probability, okay, with very high success rate at, at around 60% by just adding less than 1% of padding bytes at the end. And this can be done without compromising the um, intrusive functionality of the malware sample because you're just adding files, that, just adding, in some sense, uh, bytes that will never be executed by, by the program. Okay, so this can be done safely and can also be done by changing bytes in the header of the file. So you can manipulate some areas that do not compromise the functionality of the executable file, of the exploitation code that is embedded. That's just, just another example. So the main uh, take-home message for the first uh, part of the talk is that, yes, it is true that machine learning is empowering you know, a lot of applications, giving us a lot of advantages, but at the same time, um, aside from these big possibilities, there are also a number of threats that we have to, to consider. And this was just some examples, and uh, there is a, the main general problem, which here I just described very quickly, uh, is so the question is why machine learning is vulnerable. The answer is that um, it, it's, it's based on some underlying assumptions which are easily violated when you operate in adversarial settings. In particular, the problem that is that uh, most of the machine learning algorithms are based on the, on the so-called IID assumption. So data is assumed to be sampled, uh, the, both the training and the test data are assumed to be sampled from the same distribution. And in, in, in practice, this means that uh, the testing data that you will uh, encounter during operation phase has to be very close uh, to the training data, to the data you use to, to learn your system. Close in the sense that you, you can expect that the, the, the algorithm works reasonably well if you have uh, a small amount of noise on your data, of, of stochastic noise. That's, that's the, you, we can phrase this assumption with this uh, practical view. And, uh, when you operate in an adversarial setting, the noise that the adversary shapes to mislead the algorithm is not uh, random at all. It's designed on purpose to fool the algorithm. And this, cause, this causes a distribution shift from training and test. And so by essentially violating this underlying assumption, it's easy to fool all the, all the kinds of algorithm that we have nowadays. Uh, we've done a lot of work by showing that you can fool supervised learning algorithms like uh, the ones that we, that we discussed before. You can also fool unsupervised algorithms like clustering, feature selection processes. All the algorithms that are developed under this assumption are uh, 
inherently vulnerable to this uh, kind of uh, adversarial noise that an attacker can craft. Okay, so that's the main that's the main that's the main point. And so the next question is, how should we design uh, learning algorithms or, or classifiers to be resilient under attack? Okay, and here, of course, the main notion is that we cannot use the classical paradigm, but we have to use, uh, let's say, we have to mimic what is, what is done in, in security engineering or in other areas. So we have to bridge the gap between machine learning and the, the research that is often done in, in security. And so the main notion that you can find there is the notion of the arms race between the defense system and the attacker, right? So um, you have your, when you put your system into operation, then you will have an attacker that can analyze the system, devise and execute attacks against them, against it. And then from the defender point of view, you can look at the attacks that you received and try to patch the system in a reactive way. So that's the reactive arms race cycle. <clears throat> And what we should also do is trying to proactively anticipate the attacker, which means we, we should, ourselves as system designers, we should impersonate the attacker, so try to figure out which are the potential ways uh, that an attacker can use to mislead our learning algorithm, okay? So the specific machine learning component that you put in your system. And uh, to this end, you have, you, you can, you, you need some tools, right? You need a methodology for, to design to figure out which are these potential attacks and how to craft them. And in particular, you need to create a model of the adversary, which essentially is a threat model for your specific application case. And then you need methods to simulate the attack. In this way, you try to be, as often done in security, you try to be one step ahead of the attacker and try to anticipate potential attacks, right? This is, and this can be done at a level of, at a more theoretical level, at, at a simulation or empirical level, depends on the, on the approach that you, that you pursue. And so we can basically, in, the, in, this, in this kind of research, we like to phrase this as, using these three metaphors. So uh, one is know your adversary, which amounts to constructing a model of, of attacks that you can use to simulate attacks against your system. Being proactive means simulating the attacks and measuring the performance of your system under different attack scenarios that you can think of, and then protect your classifiers is about designing defenses against these potential attacks. Um, so the, the tutorial is organized uh, along these three lines. So in the first part, I will just describe how uh, we can model attacks against machine learning algorithms. Okay. So that's the uh, first rule, know your adversary. <clears throat> what we try to do is to systematize this model across the years. So there has been some initial research from uh, a group in Berkeley at around 2006, 2010. Then we did also, uh, we built on top of that, and in the end we agreed, let's say, on, on more or less the model that I'm presenting today, where you have three main components. So we have to make uh, assumptions on what is the goal of the attacker, what's the knowledge that he or she has about your system, and how we can, he or she can manipulate data to reach the goal. Okay, now, <clears throat> In this model, um, this methodology suggests way that you can use to reason and think of potential attacks. And at the end, I will show how to, let's say, put all together to have a consistent view. So regarding the, the attacker's goal, um, it's, it's, the, the main objective can be to cause different security violations. Okay, so if we look at the security literature, this is mostly classified in integrity violations availability violations and privacy violation. Okay, this is known as the CIA triad in, in, in security. So what does it mean to, when you think of these vulnerabilities or these security violations in the machine learning field? So integrity means that you would like <clears throat> to enforce a classifier to make errors without compromising the normal operation of the system. So the typical example you have is that you have a malware sample and you would like to have this misclassified as legitimate. Okay, that's, that's an integrity violation because it's not compromising, if it's not compromising the usage of the system for, for legitimate users. Availability violations, on the contrary, aim to purposely um, block legitimate users in using the system. So it's, it's, it's essentially a denial of service. Confidentiality or privacy violations amounts to um, 
having attacks that aim to get confidential or private information from this, for, uh, of the system or of its users. And there are attacks in which you can query the algorithm, for example, if it's provided as a service, you can query the algorithm several times and you can be able to reconstruct maybe images of faces of users that, that use the system if it's doing face recognition, for example, or there are these kind of things. So you can infer private information from the system. So that's for the um, main attacker's goal. You can make assumptions on the knowledge, so what the attacker knows about the system, and this is typically done by making specific assumptions of, on what the attacker knows about the training data. Um, if he can know partially the data, the training data used to learn your system, or he can know it, if, it's a, if it's trained on a public database, then the attacker, of course, knows the training data. Right? If you train your classifier on ImageNet, ImageNet is public, so the assumption is that the attacker may know the data. If you train your system on private data, then you should not assume that the attacker knows the data. You can make assumptions on the feature representation, so whether the attacker knows that you, which kind of features you use, uh, for example, in for malware classification, you can do static analysis, just looking at the code without executing the malware in a sandbox, or you can simulate the execution of malware and, and extract features from these dynamic analysis results. So, and the degree to which the attacker knows these uh, features depends on, on the assumption that you, that you make. So, he may know that uh, you're doing just static analysis, or he may exactly know the kind of features that you extract, right? So, there are different a different, there is a different spectrum of uh, knowledge that you can assume here. And then <clears throat> there are assumptions that you can also make on the learning algorithm. So normally you can assume, um, you can put a hypothesis by saying the attacker knows the learning algorithm, so they know the kind of learning algorithm that is used. For example, if it's a convolutional network or if it's an SVM or uh, a decision tree or whichever other algorithm you, you may think of. <laughs> If, if he knows, the, for example, the architecture of the network, if he knows the hyperparameter settings, for example, uh, the amount of regularization that you use to train your algorithm, up to the point where the attacker may also know the exact parameters that are learned by your classifier, okay? So if the attacker knows everything about the system, we are in the case of perfect knowledge attacks. And this is also uh, the white box case. So. It's the worst case for the defender when, when the, you assume that the attacker knows everything. It's a very pessimistic case, also in practice, but it's very useful, especially when you test your system, to understand which is the worst case. So you can cite the worst case, and then when you relax the assumptions and you say, okay, now the attacker maybe doesn't know exactly the learning algorithm, then you can do another evaluation and see how far you are from the worst case. So it's very important in any case to assess uh, the worst case scenario, performance. And then of course, if you relax some of the assumptions, you can have different attacks ranging from black box to gray box attacks, okay, as we see in the literature. But the, here, let me specify that uh, by following the Kirchhoff's principle, or if you prefer, it, it, it's a way of phrasing the security by design principle. When we design machine learning system in adversarial settings, we should not make, uh, we should not assume attackers that are too weak. Okay, so normally it's a good practice to assume that the attacker knows, uh, maybe doesn't know the training data that you use, but it's reasonably uh, to assume that he knows the features that you extract from data and the kind of learning algorithm at least. Okay, so for example, if you use an SVM trained on this given feature, then it's good to assume this and assess the performance under this case. And as I said, more, in, more generally, it's better to have uh, different kinds of evaluation where you assume different attackers with different power, and then you test the performance of the system against these different scenarios, okay? <clears throat> as for the, for the capability, so the capability regards the fact, uh, what, should the, what should we assume that the attacker can change? How can he manipulate data, right? This is the, the problem. As you probably know, machine learning algorithms consist of two main phases. They, there is a phase where they learn, so they are trained, and there is a phase there with, there with, where they classify, so where, where you put them in the testing phase. And so, uh, similarly, you can assume that there are cases in which the attacker may be able to tamper your training data. For example, if you have a system which is retrained online, 
uh, maybe you're, you're training a network intrusion detection system and there is a compromised machine that you don't know of. And therefore the attacker can inject some traffic, some malicious traffic that, you, that ends up in your, in your training set, right? That's an example. And the example of attacks here as poisoning and backdoors that we will discuss uh, briefly later. Or in the, normally the attacker can also change the test data. So this means the system is already trained and now it, it's put into operation. And now what the attacker can do is manipulate his instances to mislead detection. So this is the easiest case where you have, for example, an antivirus which is running online and then you have to modify your malware samples to evade detection. So that's the, 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 the easiest case for the attacker. Of course, uh, this is not all about the capability of the attacker because there are other practical constraints. And luckily, the adversary in, in many cases is constrained. Otherwise, this game would be always uh, win by an attacker, always won by an attacker. Uh, since the attacker is constrained, it means that he cannot modi modify samples uh, without any constraint. So, for example, email messages can be manipulated by spammers, but they have in some sense to preserve readability uh, to convey the message to the human reader. So the attacker cannot delete the entire spam message from the, from the spam email, right? There is a constraint in this case, and for malware classification, it's even uh, easier to understand that you cannot modify the malware in an unconstrained way, because otherwise you would break its intrusive functionality. Okay? You, you would break the exploitation code, and the exploit doesn't work anymore. So there, there are some constraints which can be formalized uh, in some cases. Typically, uh, what you do when you assume that the attacker can uh, tamper with the training data is that you assume that he can only manipulate a small fraction of your training points. Okay? In the example that I gave before, if you take a network intrusion detection system, it's, it's likely that you may have only a small portion of the traffic that can be manipulated by the attacker. Because if the attacker can control uh, the majority of your network, then, I mean, there's, there's no game, right? And uh, for the testing phase, as I said, this set of constraints can also be encoded um, more formally. So, for example, um, what, what, what is typically done is to, form, uh, the, to assume that you can modify some, some parts of your, of your samples. In, par in particular, for example, for spam emails, or in the case of, of classification of spam and legitimate emails, you can assume that the attacker can change a given number of words in each spam. Okay. And this can be formalized by um, <coughs> defining a feasible domain in your feature space. So if the feature space, for example, is just the presence or absence of words in emails, so you have a dictionary of words, and it's, uh, for each email you have zero or one, uh, meaning that the, the word is not present or present in the, in the current email. And now if you want to count how many words are changed, you just compute the mean distance between these, uh, these two vectors, right? And this can be formalized as, as for example, an L1 constraint in, in feature space. And then this is what you get. And again, here, which kind of assumptions should we make on the attacker's capability um, is again a matter of uh, approaching the problem from a security by design perspective. So again, also here, we, we suggest to do worst case evaluations where the attacker can manipulate um, significantly the data, and he can manipulate the data in different ways. So for example, in the case of spam, what we are suggesting is, since we don't know how many words will be changed, we have just to run the evaluation against a different number of, of uh, uh, modified words in each email. And then I will show that this will lead us to design the, what we call a security evaluation curve. So a curve that shows how the performance of the classifier change as soon as the attacker gains increasing power or increasing knowledge about the system. Okay, so we will, de we will develop uh, attacks of increasing power and, and test the system against it. And this will be uh, clear uh, later on. Okay, that was roughly the description of, of the model. Of course, here, I didn't put any equa equations, but what you can do is also uh, write all these things in a more formal way, and in the end, the goal is um, to make different assumptions on the various components of the model, goal, knowledge, and capability, and at the end, depending on the assumptions that you make, you will get uh, an optimization problem that the attacker has to solve to craft his instances. Okay, so I will clarify this uh, as we go on. 
with, with practical examples. And in fact, we start by um, um, entering the part where we simulate attacks. So here, the, the goal is being proactive means now we define the model, now we use the model to craft the optimal attacks uh, against our system. <laughs> optimal in the sense that they solve an optimization problem, which uh, comes down from this model. So now we are, I'm, I'm just, I just want to give you a sort of historical perspective on how we get to the idea of crafting these attacks uh, around 2012-13, and, uh, and then I will introduce the problem, the, the optimization problem. So um, at around, let's say, 2007, 2008, when I started, um, we started looking at the problem of spam filters, and they, they are mostly linear classifiers trained on uh, Boolean features, as I said. You have a dictionary of words, you just check in each email if a given word is present or not, and then you associate a feature of one if the word is present. So in this case, if you, if you take uh, this spam message, its, it's feature vector corresponds to this one, right? So you have one for the present words, which are also in the dictionary. And evading this classifier is very easy, because for linear classifiers, you can see that there is a weight assigned to each word. In this case, if it's a malicious word, we can assume that it's been assigned a positive weight. If it's a benign word, it's assigned a negative weight. Uh, because we just set the positive class to be spam and the negative one to be legitimate, but this is completely general. And so in this case, this is a spam email. Now you can compute the classification output, so the score that the classifier gives to this email by just summing up the weights that correspond to the words which are present in the email. So in this case, you have to sum up two, one, 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 and so on, and the result is six. Okay, this is uh, just a linear classification. Do a scalar product between the weight vector and the feature vector, and you, and you Get a, get a value. Assuming that the threshold is zero, it's easy to see that this is correctly classified as a spam email. Okay, I hope it's, it's clear for everybody. And now it's, uh, I think it's fairly easy to understand how we can fool this algorithm, right? How we can manipulate the spam message to have this email misclassified as legitimate. It's very easy. You can think of tweaking a little bit the uh, spammy words. For example, you can change some characters. This is called bad word obfuscation or you can inject, try to guess which words are learned by legitimate by the filter and try to, in, to inject them in, in your email. This is called good word insertion attacks. And so, for example, if you manipulate the email in this way, you have that, as humans, you can still understand the message because I just changed an A with a four in start and bang, and then I added this, this legitimate word. Now, to further enhance the human readability, you can even so this is actually what happens. The good words that are injected can also be painted in white so that when you open your email, you cannot read them, but they are there for the machine, right? And uh, now if you sum up the contribution of these words, you see that there's no longer start and bang detected here. There's campus, which is an additional word, and if you sum up the weights, you got minus one. And now this email is misclassified as legitimate, right? So we have evaded these simple linear classifiers. So for linear classifiers, it was fairly easy to show that they can be evaded. But what happens if the classifier is nonlinear? So what should we do to evade nonlinear classifiers where there is no clear relationship between the weights and the feature vectors, right? So it's not clear if I change a word in a given email how it will affect the output of the classifier. And in fact, it was not clear up to the point that in 2013, this paper was, part, this is just an example, there were, there were other, other papers where this, the same claim was made. In this case, these authors were working of, of the, on the problem of detecting malware in PDF files. So it means computer viruses that an attacker can inject or can embed within a PDF file. And then you can receive an email with this PDF, if you open it, then your computer is compromised, okay? And uh, for this, they um, use a simple approach and they use learning algorithms. Then there is a section where they evaluate different, the security of, or robustness of different learning algorithms against these um, evasive attempts crafted by an attacker. And they tested support vector machines with the linear and the non, and the nonlinear kernel, okay? And what they found is that um, they were able, while they were able to evade the linear SVM, 
using a mechanism which is similar to what I previously described, they were not able to evade the nonlinear SVM, the one with the Gaussian kernel. And in fact, they state that uh, they were only able to evade it for a tiny fraction of malicious samples, and they do not have a clear explanation for that, but they believe that uh, the complexity of the classifier uh, made it more secure against these uh, evasive attempts. So the reason, or the, 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 their explanation behind this improved robustness was that uh, the complexity of this feature mapping that this classifier learns from input to output space was the key to have uh, a more secure classifier. Okay, so that was their main point. And this was published on, uh, I think, NDSS, which is anyway a, a top tier conference in computer security, okay? So I, when I read this, uh, since I knew these guys uh, from before, because I was working with them on another problem before, I called them and I said, I'm not sure this is, uh, <laughs> this, I suspect that there is, there is a, this disclaim is, is overstating uh, the security property of nonlinear algorithms. And then we reasoned on that and we came up with this idea, which was inspired from what we did for linear classifiers. So for linear classifiers, what was the goal? The goal was uh, we have an output, so we have the score of our classifier, which is positive for the malicious class. And then the attacker manipulates the data trying to reduce the value, right? Well, and then we can formalize this. So the goal of the attacker is minimizing the classifier output on the malicious class. So g of x is the malicious, maliciousness of your sample. And he can try to reduce this value, minimize it by changing the values in x, which is your sample. So x prime here is the manipulated sample. So if you look at the problem in a simplified space, it's like you have an instance x, which is correctly classified as malicious in this space. Okay, so red means malicious, blue means legitimate. And now, of course, there are constraints of in the manipulation that, we, that are depicted here with this feasible domain. For example, if you bound the number of words you can change in spam, you have a similar constraint. But for example, for PDF malware, you can assume that you can only inject objects that gives you another feasible domain with, a, with another shape. It's, it's, it's again a very easy constraint, very convex and, and easy to, to deal with. And so this is the formalization of the problem in the end. You aim to minimize the score subject to manipulation constraints, okay, which are bounded by this parameter dmax. dmax can be the number of words that you modify in your spam or the number of objects you're allowed to inject in your PDF file. And uh, once you see this problem, this is, uh, from an optimization point of view, this is a nonlinear constraint optimization problem. You can solve it with a plethora of algorithms. The easiest one are the, the, three, the easiest one is the gradient descent, right? So you compute the gradient of the function, you manipulate the, the sample along this direction, and eventually you find a local minimum of the problem, which ideally evades detection. And in fact, if you run a gradient descent like algorithm here, you find this kind of path. So the x prime point that you find the solution is now uh, in the blue space, right? So it's misclassified as legitimate with the highest possible confidence from the classifier. Confidence in the legitimate class, of course. Uh, now the interesting thing in, in, this, in this paper was that uh, gradients can be easily computed for many learning algorithms. And this kind of gradients, the reason is that these kind of gradients are basically the same that you use for training the algorithm. Okay, so you, it's essentially the same gradient times just another little piece at the end. And so for, many, for all the algorithms that you can train with gradient descent, then you, have this, you, you can compute this gradient. At that time, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch, they were not really popular, so we had to compute the gradients by hand in the, in the old way. And this is uh, just um, the computation of gradients for support vector machines with the Gaussian kernel which is, of course, differentiable, and neural networks uh, with, a, with a hidden layer. Okay, just to show you how to compute the derivatives. And then this can be applied. Uh, in our paper, we applied this to MNIST images and, PDF, and the PDF malware detection case. And this is just an example of the application of this algorithm to the MNIST images. In this case, the problem was to distinguish bef between trees and sevens. So it's just a two-class uh, case, and 
the, the first digit is the original sample on your left, and then the one on the right is the digit slightly manipulated by the attack algorithm and misclassified as a seven. And as you can see here, surprisingly, this modified tree does not even uh, resemble a seven at all, right, for us. It's just changing a couple of pixels. Just changing a couple of pixels is enough to, to evade the detection of the algorithm. And so we can say that this is the first adversarial example crafted with a gradient-based attack. So the, the, the net contribution of this work was to formalize the problem of attacking a learning algorithm as an optimization problem. That was the idea. At this point, one may argue that uh, in this case, we are too optimistic because we assume that the attacker knows everything. So in this case, the algorithm is known, the parameter, the training parameters are known, so I know the weights that the SVM gives to, the, to, the, to each pixel here, for example. And then one may say this is, too, this is too trivial for the attacker. So what happens if the attacker doesn't know the learning algorithm, or at least he doesn't know exactly the parameters that the classifier has learned after training? Well, in this case, uh, by under this assumption, what the attacker can do is, in, in many practical settings, is collecting some data, ideally from the same distribution of the data used to train the real classifier. For example, for MNIST, you can assume the attacker can have a different partition of, of the data set, so you can, you can collect some other examples of trees and seven. And then you have your, your own uh, data set as an attacker. So what you can do is you can uh, send these samples to the real classifier if you have access to the classifier and get the labels back. For example, let's say I want to um, mislead the Gmail classification filter. I want to bypass the spam filter control of Google, right? So what you can do as an attacker to implement this mechanism is create yourself an account on Gmail and send email to your account. Now, if you receive the email, that's classified as legitimate. If the email ends up in the spam folder, then it's, it's spam, so you can observe the labels. In many systems, you can query the system and get the feedback back. And so, this is used to relabel the data that the attacker has collected, and guess what the attacker can do now? So what you can do now is essentially train your own algorithm to approximate the original one that you don't know. So you can create a function, f prime, which is close enough to, to f, you don't know f, but you can construct an approximation. And then you can run your attack algorithm against your surrogate classifier and send the samples to the original classifier and see if they work. Okay, this is not even, uh, was not even new in 2013. It's a practice uh, quite known in, in black box optimization techniques. So when you try to optimize a function which you don't know the gradients of, you can construct a, a differentiable approximation. That's, that's the main idea, and it's the same here. Now, surprisingly, this also works very well if you don't even use this mechanism of relabeling things. So if you keep the original labels, it still works very well, because in most of the cases, classifiers are very accurate, so they tend to find the same solution. So you don't even, know, uh, you don't even need to relabel uh, things. You don't, even, you don't even need to send queries if your training data is representative enough of, of the real one that is used by the classifier. <clears throat> okay, and, this, is, um, and, and this principle has also been used uh, later to show that you can even craft attacks against different learning algorithms. So you can, for example, craft an attack against an SVM and then test if it works against a neural net, okay? In this, uh, this further work by Nicholas Papernod, and this is called the transferability property of, of attacks. And so it's, surprisingly, it's surprising to see that they work even if they're not crafted against the same algorithm. But I'll give you more hints about this because it, this seems to be some obscure magic property of attacks. I have to say that in some cases it works very well, in other cases it doesn't, and there is a reason, okay? Let me also show some more recent results on another uh, problem. So this problem is Android malware detection. I like to make this example to uh, not just play with images, but also show that you can have the same problem in more um, cybersecurity related tasks, right? So for Android malware detection, there are simple approaches to do static analysis. So you take uh, the APK, so the, the Android application, and you can look at which permissions are used by the application, with API, which APIs are called, these kind of things. So you can construct, again, 
a Boolean vector that denotes the presence or absence of some specific feature, permission, or, or whatever. Okay, and this is an approach. Uh, it's very popular. It's called Drebin. It was published in 2014. And then on top of this, you can train a linear classifier, non-linear classifier, whatever you like. <clears throat> and we did some experiments here by showing that you can manipulate some of the properties that the application has to full detection. So the goal is you have a, mal a malicious Android application, you can manipulate it to evade detection. <laughs> and now, um, in these plots, you see on the left you have PK, which means perfect knowledge. So this is the white box case. The attacker knows exactly the classifier that is going to attack. In this case, you see that you have more than 90% when zero features are modified. This is the detection rate at 1% false positive rate uh, when you do not modify anything. So this, it is, is the, the standard performance. Most malware samples are correctly detected, okay? So more than 90%. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, when you vary the number of features that you can change, in this case, we inject uh, features, so it means we request additional permissions or we make additional API calls, these kind of things. When you inject the number of modified features, what you see is that the performance drops very quickly. So up to five to 15 modifications for all malware samples in this data set, you're able to evade detection. Okay, so the detection rate goes to zero in this case. And in the limited knowledge case, it's more or less the same story. You have a little bit improvement in terms of security because the attacker doesn't know exactly the weights or the parameters of the classifier, but using this idea of the surrogate model, you can still break uh, the classifier very easily by doing 15 to 50 modifications. So you have a slight improvement given by security by obscurity in some sense, but still the attacker can uh, be able to, to evade your, your system, okay? So the, the main takeaways here are um, that both type of algorithms, linear and nonlinear, can be shown to be vulnerable to attacks. And the important thing here is the evaluation methodology also to, to, to recall, where we do not evaluate the classifier performance against one and only one possible attack scenario, but we have this parameter D max that changes. So we allow the attacker to manipulate uh, more and more the data. And these curves effectively shows the sensitivity of the classifier to different perform, to different, uh, to, to the increasing uh, power of the attack, which means that if the curve decreases more gracefully, you have a more robust system. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Now the question is why is machine learning so vulnerable? We, we roughly discussed that it's because we violate the IID assumption, that's the general uh, point. But in this case, in the specific case of Android, you can actually look at the, the reasons why it, it's, it's so vulnerable. And to this end, we constructed some, some, let's say, representation that summarizes what the classifier learns in a sort of exp explainability fashion. Uh, the thing is that uh, the classifier starts learning from a huge space of features. In this case of Drebin, in the data set, you have roughly uh, some hundred thousand features, okay? But the classifier that you train here relies just on 50 to 100 most relevant features. So that's one of the reasons. And this is summarized in this, um, in this picture. So here, it's a summary of what the classifier learns. Now, I'm not going into the detail of this, but you can see here you have a set of roughly 50 features, which are the most relevant ones to classify benign and malware uh, samples. So th this is the first problem. So it's learning from a large, for a very large high-dimensional space, but it's learning just on a subset of features. So that the effective decisions rely on, on a small subset. And this means that you have a large sensitivity. So if the attacker modify one of these features, then you have a large change in the output. So that's, that's the one problem. And the other interesting phenomenon is that if you learn, even if you learn different classifiers on the same data, so you learn maybe an SVM, then you learn another classifier which has a different loss function, whatever you like, even if you start from different formulations, different classifiers, more or less they tend to learn the same thing. Which means if I draw the same uh, scheme that you see on the right, for different classifiers, more or less you get the same. 
And now this is interesting because it explains why attack transfers uh, from different classifiers. It's not because the attack has some magic property, but it's effectively because the classifiers that you learn are the same thing. Okay, so that's, that's the main notion. So they tend to learn the same relevant features and tend to learn which are good and which are bad for, for classification. So that's the, the main reason, at least on this data that we look at. <clears throat> okay, now uh, I'd like to uh, discuss, um, okay. I'd like to discuss the, what happened in 2013 where these uh, problems became quite popular, and not only to the research community, but also to other stakeholders and the press. You know, we, we had a, a, the, there was a big uh, uh, discussion on these issues when um, Christian Zajedi, Young Goodfellow, and others from, from Google Brain discovered this phenomenon of uh, adversarial examples. So I'd like to um, tell you how essentially um, we found the same issue. So we didn't find this for deep nets, okay? So we, just, we, we are just looking at uh, standard machine learning classifiers and basic neural nets. But the idea of uh, attacking these classifiers with gradient-based attack is, is essentially the same. But uh, the interesting thing is how they reach more or less to find the same phenomenon that we discovered. Because what they were doing was to look at the, uh, they were trying to explain what a neural, or understand what a neural network learns. So if you have a good classifier that is able to discriminate objects correctly, they were taking the image of a bus and modify it, trying to see when the classifier switches the decision. For example, when you have this bus and it's misclassified as an ostrich. So you expect that at some point the bus grows some feathers, you expect to see something like that, right? When, when, you, when you gradually modify the image. And instead what they found was that uh, uh, the, person, the, the noise that you are required to add to the image to flip the classification was very small. Okay, and this was very surprising because these classifiers are very accurate, widely used, and then it was really uh, impactful to show that you can fool them in, in this very easy and surprising way. Okay, so that was the, the main thing, and the formulation is uh, slightly different because they look for the minimal noise that you, that you are required to add to the image to have it misclassified as desired. So they're not uh, minimizing the output of the classifier, they're not maximizing the confidence of these examples, they are optimizing the noise by minimizing the distance the Euclidean distance that you have between the two images. And in fact, this function here, f is the distance, um, uh, minimize r, r is the distance between the two images, okay? And this is a different label that you'd like to assign. And so in the end, they find this minimal amount of noise that uh, shows that you can flip the decision. <clears throat> this was shown with, uh, again, a gradient, so this problem, was solved using, again, a gradient-based uh, algorithm. In this case, they use uh, LBFGS, which is a popular gradient descent technique with constraints. Okay, so it's the, the, the solution algorithm, is, I think, is very similar. And after that, just, I'm not going to cover all the literature of uh, adversarial examples in deep learning, because that's huge. But I just like to mention that after this, uh, many defenses have been proposed to to solve this problem, so detect this sort of strange adversarial examples at minimum distance, and then they've shown, that these defenses have shown to be broken because essentially the attacks were not considering the defense mechanism. <coughs> so if you then consider that you have a detector or that you modify the learning algorithm within the attack, then you can easily break it. Okay, so that does, again, this notion of arms race uh, pops up here as well between the research com in the research community. From, from attackers and defenders. And there are uh, many, many different variants of attacks, but most of them are still based on the idea of um, using different gradient-based algorithms, okay? So they are variants of the either the optimization problem, formulation, or the solution algorithm that you use. That's the main difference that you have. And the, just the most popular ones to, to cite them, the fast gradient sign method was the first one developed by Goodfellow to show this vulnerability. Then you have the Jacobian saliency map attack by Nicholas Paperno, and probably the most effective and popular one is the Carlini and Wagner attack. Okay, that's just to mention a few, but there are at least, uh, I think, 16 to 20 different variants of attacks. 
And this is just to show you that uh, trying to keep pace with this uh, area of research is crazy. So this is an estimate by David Evans. It was done in uh, mid-2018. So I should check how many papers we had this year, but uh, the estimate for 2018 was more than 1,200 papers on the topics, on just on the topic of adversarial examples, okay? This is, and many of them, I mean, you can spot that they make wrong premises from the title. So that's, that's, uh, that's fun. Um, okay. In the next part, I'd like to discuss, so, so far we've discussed attacks at test time, so evasion attacks f against two class classifiers. So we just have two classes, malware and benign, right? Here I'm just discussing a case study that we did in a robot vision system, uh, mostly to extend the attack in the multi-class case, okay? So where you have more than two classes. Now the case that we consider is the, is the case involving this robot. This is called the ICAB robot. It uses uh, AlexNet, basically as a feature extractor, and then uh, linear classifiers trained on top of this representation to distinguish different classes of objects. Now the reason they use linear classifiers is simply uh, to be able to incrementally train the algorithm on, on, on board of the robot, okay? So you need something which is efficient and, and can be fastly updated. So you keep the network fixed, and then you just update your linear models on top of it. So you can do it online. The sets of objects that this robot is meant to recognize are these 28 different ones, uh, which are four different classes of laundry detergents, plates, uh, dishwashing uh, detergents, sponges, cups, and so on and so forth. Okay, those are the 28 classes that this one aims to recognize. And now we don't clearly have two classes, so when I want to have a sample misclassified as an attacker, I can have different options, right? And very simply, you can aim to have an untargeted attack, so an error generic um, attack, as we call it, which means if I have, for example, the image of a detergent, then I'm happy as an attacker to have it misclassified as any other object in the data, okay? That's the untargeted or error generic attack. Whereas there are maybe cases in which I specifically want to have this sample misclassified in a specific class. And this is the error specific case. For example, if I want my detergent to be misclassified specifically as a cup, I am in this case. Okay, so it's a different, um, it's two different variants of the attack where you can or not specify the target class. That's the main idea. To disambiguate the notion of error in, in multi-class cases. That, that's essentially the reason. And then it's not difficult to extend the attack from the two-class case to this case. You have to tweak a little bit the objective function. So remember the, the old case where we minimize just the score on the malicious class, right? In this case, we still minimize the score on the true class, which is this FK here. But at the same time, we try to maximize the score of the competing class that you have. And in this way, you can see that if you start from a blue point, this attack tries to minimize the contribution that the classifier gives to the blue class, whereas it tries to maximize the contribution to the red class. Okay, so the point is gradually moved from the blue to the red, to the red area. Now the red class here is just selected because it's the closest one to the blue one, to the blue point here in the, in the feature space. Okay, that's the reason. But if it can be any other class, I mean, typically the closest one is chosen by this formulation because if you don't specify the target class, the attack algorithm will pick the easiest one to, to reach. In the error specific case, instead you need to uh, change a little bit the, the role of, of uh, these functions, but the, the formulation is pretty much the same. So instead of minimizing here, we maximize the function, and f of k becomes here the target class. So let's say my target class is green, I'm maximizing the contribution uh, of the green class, while minimizing the contribution of the competing class, or the actual class that is assigned to the sample. So if the sample is blue and it is correctly classified, you start from the blue class, you reduce the value of the blue class and you, while you try to increase the, the value of the green class. And then the point is directed towards the green class. Okay, so that's the case 
And again, you just change the formulation of the optimization problem, but then the solution algorithm is, is basically the same. You take the gradient of the objective and you optimize that with any uh, algorithm, solution algorithm that you, can, that you can use. Gradients can be computed uh, easily in this case. Uh, you have the gradient of the classifier in the last layer. If it's linear, it's just a set of weights that the, that the classifier gives to the features. And then you backpropagate it through the network. So this is the same mechanism that you use to train deep nets. Okay, you just backpropagate gradients. And you backpropagate up to the input space. That's the only difference. Instead of just stopping to update the parameters. And interestingly, we've also, this is just an example where you show that uh, you have this detergent, you just change some pixels, and this is misclassified as a cup. 290 here is just the, the Euclidean distance with respect to the original unmodified detergent image. Okay, this is just an example. And this is a probably more interesting case where we bound the noise to be placed on the region of the label that you have on the detergent. Okay, so you see that there is a small rectangle which is the only part of the image which is modified. You can do this with a simple box constraint. And now the algorithm will optimize only those pixels, okay? Of course, you need a larger uh, noise in this case because the attacker is more constrained. But the nice thing is that in this case, you can ideally print a sticker, put it on the object, and uh, mis uh, have it misclassified in the physical world, okay? Because normally, you cannot modify any pixel, uh, every pixel in, in images, right? If, if it's in the background, it cannot be modified when you create the, the real instance. So that was... Uh, a, a simple example. Now I'd like to discuss quickly, <clears throat> make quickly a point on uh, how to counter this attack. Uh, as, I saw, as I said, there are many defenses that have been proposed, but here I just want to focus on two classes of defenses, which I think are those that work uh, really. Okay? <laughs> and they are based, one is based on uh, robust optimization, which means basically you're trying to increase the distance that you have uh, from the boundary to the samples. So it's in some sense trying to increase the margin that you have, the input margin that you have um, um, in, in, the, in this classification problem. And the other one is based on rejecting samples. So it's, the idea is to give the classifier the possibility to say, I don't know uh, which object is this, or I cannot classify it reliably. Okay, this could be the case where you have a suspect attack, you can say, I, I, I'm not classifying this. This can be regarded as a potential attack. Please investigate further, for example. Okay, so let's give more, some more details in the first case. So, uh, I mean, there is a bit of ma mathematical details here, but I think uh, we can keep it manageable. So in the standard problem, when you learn the classifier, you just have the minimiza minimization over W, so you minimize the loss function over the classifier parameters, right? This is the standard case. So if you ideally have this data set on your, on your right, you can see the green and the red points, and the line is a potential classifier that is just learned by solving the minimiz min minimization of the loss. Okay, that's the standard case. Now what the inner loop does here, it's simulating the attack, essentially. So the attacker is trying to maximize the loss on the same sample, with respect to delta, which is the perturbation that you add to images. And this delta is bounded somehow by some constraints. In this case, if you select uh, the infinity norm of delta, it's like putting hypercubes on each training point. So you're telling the attacker can modify the points within these hypercubes, okay? And they will be modified in a way that the loss is maximized. This is the inner loop. So what happens is that you shift the points towards the boundary, and this is the effect that you have. So the new points will be shifted, and then, of course, this process iterates. So in the next iteration, the algorithm will be retrained on the modified samples, up until you reach some equilibrium, if, if there is one, okay? And this is an example. As you can see, this classifier now correctly detects against the attacks. Um, this procedure is also called adversarial training in, in its uh, uh, basic um, formulation, okay? But interestingly, uh, in some cases where you can linearize the loss and the classifier, for example, is linear, you can show that you can get rid of the inner optimization part, 
which is very computationally intensive, especially if you have uh, a large input space, right? In the case of images, you would have to generate adversarial examples to retrain your algorithm, and, and this is very computationally intensive, and it's not even effective in the end very much. So the, the nice thing is that in some cases you can get rid of this problem and you can show that it is equivalent to a regularized loss function where the regularizer is specifically dependent on the kind of noise that you assume on the data. So this is a simple, uh, it's, it's easy to, demo, to demonstrate, it's just a, a maximization of a scalar product on uh, an LP ball and it, this is a easy in, uh, it's an easy optimization trick. What turns out is that the regularizer that you have to use has to, has to use the dual norm of the noise. So if you have an infinity norm noise, you have, to, you have to use an L1 regularizer and vice versa. If you have Euclidean noise, you have to have uh, Euclidean uh, regularizer, so an L2 regularization. That's a very interesting finding, and it's also equivalent. You see here that I have the gradient of F because the classifier ideally is nonlinear. And this, is also, this was also proposed as a double backprop or gradient-based regularization as a countermeasure to, to adversarial examples. And in fact, is equivalent to retraining uh, to, one, to these one-step adversarial attacks in this case. Uh, for the linear classifiers, it's very interesting because you have, let's say, a perfect match. And uh, we apply this to the case of the Android malware that I discussed before. And uh, since the attack uh, that we ran on this Android pro uh, detection problem was sparse, uh, in this, it, it was an L1 attack in the sense that the attacker aims to manipulate uh, less feature as possible. The optimal regularizer turns out to be the infinity norm uh, on the par uh, weight parameters. Okay, so, and you have this formulation which is called infinity norm SVM, or we call it sec SVM in the paper, but uh, it's the same thing. And what you have here is that, uh, remember, so this is the evaluation. So remember the first curve that I showed you, that was the green one, right? Now the blue one is an empirical defense based on combining classifiers, which gives you slightly more robustness to the attack, but not that much. And this, the, the red lines are those obtained by training this secure SVM, so this uh, infinity norm uh, classifier. And what you get is a, much larger robustness. Of course, at the end, you will be able to break the system, but this will require you much more modifications, okay? And this has some optimal guarantees in the terms that I discussed before, and it has also a nice intuitive explanation, which is that when you use this regularizer, the infinity norm one, you actually bound the weight uh, that the classifier assigns to each feature. So normally, if you train the SVM, as we've seen before, it tends to give it tends to give a lot of weight to, small, to, to a subset of the features, okay? And so it's clear that if the attacker changes one of those features, he already gets a huge drop, in, in a huge change in the classification output. Whereas in this case, each feature is more or less equally weighted and uh, the weight is small. So when the attacker changes each feature, he only observes a tiny change in the output. And so to reach the same effectiveness of the attack has to change more. So that's the, um, that's the in intuitive explanation why this is uh, more robust than the other case, at least against these sparse attacks, okay? And now, as I said, um, adversarial training is also, um, in some sense, a method to achieve the same thing uh, by generating actually the samples in your training set and retraining. And what it does is, again, um, trying to push the boundary farther away from the points according to the metric that you use to uh, manipulate the data. So in this case, if it's a sparse attack and you simulate a sparse attack, you will push the boundary uh, farther away in this L1, according to this L1 distance. Okay, so that's the, that's the thing. So it's reducing the sensitivity of the function with respect to such changes. Now a quick note on uh, ineffective defenses. So as I said, many of the defenses that have been proposed turned out to be ineffective, and the reason is quite simple. So the reason is that um, you can learn essentially the same function. So the decision boundary may be exactly the same, but you may arbitrarily complicate the function that you optimize from the attacker's perspective. Uh, 
So if you, if you normally optimize this nice smooth function, so if you start from x here and you take the gradient, you find easily an x prime that evades detection. So that crosses the x axis in this case. Okay. If I have more or less the same decision boundaries, the, the boundary is still in the same position, but you complicate the function here, so the gradient is noisy now, it's easy for the attack to get stuck in a local, in a local minimum, okay, which doesn't evade detection. So all these defenses were not really effective in, in this sense. So they were not changing the classifier boundary, the decision boundary, but they were just complicating the function that the attacker has to optimize to get the attack. And then the attack algorithm didn't work. I mean, the, the, the old ones didn't work against these defenses. But of course, if you find a way to smooth out this function by, for example, using a smoother approximation or averaging gradients nearby the point that you're optimizing, well, you can get again, you can go back to this nice smoother function that it's easier to optimize for the attacker, and then you find a point that also evades the complex classifier. Okay, so um, hiding this gradient information is not enough to improve the security of, this, of these systems. <clears throat> okay. The, the other main defense I'd like to quickly talk about is uh, based on the rejection. Okay, so, and this is complementary to the one that we've discussed before. So on the one hand, you can try to improve the margin, uh, shift the boundary farther away from the points. In the other case, you can also say, instead of making a decision in every point in the space, I can have the option not to make a decision in some regions of the space. In particular, a classifier should only make decisions in, the, in regions of the space where you have enough training data, so where decisions can be made reliably. So look at this case, for example. Uh, if you have these blue and red points, you can find the evasion points, right, uh, which are far enough from the red points, not even close to the, to the legitimate class, okay? And this is because the classifier is making a decision in every point in the space, even very far away from all the training data that you have. Instead, if you apply rejection, ideally by enclosing the classes of your training set, well, you end up, uh, now this white space is rejected. So the potential attack is, in some sense is uh, identified, okay? It's, it's just called reject option in, in classification. Now, all the defense methods based on detection use the same idea. So you have an additional class where you expect the adversarial example to, to end in. And we apply this case to the iCub robot. And this is just an example. And this is the comparison. So you have uh, the green and the yellow is the standard um, mechanism without protection, without defense. You can see that as you increase the amount of noise that you apply to the image, you can evade this classifier fairly easily. And the red one is applying rejection. And just at the last layer, okay, so I'm designing a classifier that encloses the classes, and if the point is far, far away from these known clusters, then it's rejected. This is random nodes, not adversarial. This is adversarial. It's generated with the adversarial algorithm. And of course, at the beginning, you have uh, a smaller performance because you al also reject some legitimate samples. But then if the noise is reasonably small, you can detect more or less all the attacks. But then the attack gradually becomes more and more effective again. And the reason is that while you modify the point in the input space, it will reach the target class in the output space. So it will be exactly overlapped with the target class in the feature space. And this is captured very well in this image in this paper. So you have two images which are close in the input space. So this is the original one and the adversarial. And if the perturbation is sufficient here, you end up constructing an adversarial example. So this is a car image, which is within the cluster of dogs in the representation space. So you cannot reject this sample if you just look at the last layer, right? You have to inspect also the previous layers to see if you find a point where they can be distinguished. And this is the reason why this defense was only partially effective, right? Because we can detect things which are in between this space, but then if you have enough perturbation, you reach the target class, and so it's no longer effective. There's another slide or another paper where this is even explained in this way. And uh, here the idea is that so the blue one 
Um, this is the cosine distance between the original sample and the perturbed sample. The blue one is perturbed with the random noise. The red one is perturbed with this adversarial noise. And this is how happen what happens across the layers of, of a network. As you see, the random noise is, is eventually smooth, smoothed out, and so you get the correct prediction, where the, random, the adversarial noise is amplified across the layers. And then here you can see that in the last layer you can spot it, but you can also spot that there is a noise in the previous layer. So ideally, by applying this idea of rejection in previous stages, you can probably further improve the defense mechanism. And there are defenses based on this idea that work and show that you can, to fool them, you eventually have to create examples that are more, uh, more similar to the target class, okay, which is the behavior that you would expect. Now, uh, I think we are running a bit out of time. I'm running a bit late. So we also have a demo if you'd like to um, test how um, classifier works in, in this simple case of MNIST. So if you connect to this website, you can, you can make some trials. You can select a digit uh, from any class and modify it with a different perturbation and see what happens uh, to the output probabilities of, of the algorithm. And interestingly, if you increase the perturbation a lot, you get completely noisy images which are misclassified with very high confidence in the target class. Okay, so you can, you can try this by, by yourself. Um, I'd like to quickly mention also another attack which I think is uh, very interesting, which is the poisoning case. So, in, so far we've discussed uh, attacks and countermeasures at test time. So you have a trained classifier and you just want to mis have some samples misclassified. In this case, the attacker can also tamper with the training data. So the goal would be to inject training points in order to maximize the error at test time. So I want to cause an eye of service for legitimate users, for example. So if you have uh, a spam classifier, I'd like to inject some emails in your training set. So maybe I send you some emails and you label them as spam. But if I inject enough good words in this email that you cannot see, at the end, you will have many of your legitimate emails misclassified as spam. And so this, this will cause a, a denial of service in, in your case. This is just an example, but more formally, you can think that you have a classification problem. So this is an SVM trained on this data, and the classification error is 2%. And of course, the classification error is evaluated on a separate test set. Okay, so it's not evaluated on these points. It's evaluated on a separate test set. Now, if the attacker puts a point, a red point here, down here, the boundary changes, of course, because you have to learn this point as well, and the error on the untainted separated test set increases to 4%. This is just an example. What we want to do is to find the optimal attack point, so the red point XC that will maximize the error on the, on the test set. So you can visualize the objective by essentially changing the location of XC, in all the space, learning this point together with the other ones and evaluating the error on a separate test set. If you do that and plot the error, that's what you get. You get basically no change uh, if you add a red point here because this is learned as a reserve vector, so the SVM doesn't change at all. If the red point is put on the other side, you see that the error can increase and the maximum is eventually in this place, okay? This is the, the region that we want to reach. Now. This is the intuition. This can be formalized as a bi-level optimization problem, which is much more complex than the evasion case. And it's bi-level because you have two nested optimization problems. The outer one is the maximization of the loss on the clean data. Okay, so I want to maximize the error on the test set or on the validation set with respect to a training point. Subject to the fact that this training point is learned by the classifier, so the inner problem is the training problem of the classifier. Well, to make a uh, short, uh, long story short, this is complex, but in some cases you can also solve this by gradient descent. Okay, so you can, the trick is you can remove the inner problem, the inner optimization can be removed, and you can use a set of linear constraints instead, which are the equilibrium conditions of that problem, okay? And in this case, if you're interested, you can, you can refer to the papers, but uh, you get a much more complex gradient. This is just an example for the nonlinear SVM. 
And what you see here in the right hand side of the formula is that you are inverting the equilibrium conditions for the SVM. Okay? And by doing that, basically, you can, uh, you can optimize these attacks with, with gradient ascent in this case. So it's much more complex because when you shift the point, you also have to account that the classifier changes. So the classifier is no longer fixed. If you change a training point, it's changing also the boundary. And therefore, this is accounted for in this, in this formulation. And as you can see, if you initialize a point here, then it's uh, uh, optimized up to the uh, one of the local maximum. Okay, that's what you get. And just to give you a more concrete example, this is the example again on digits. In this case, uh, we have two classes, four and zero, and the initial point is a four. Now, if you just flip the label, you have only a tiny, very significant increase in the error. Okay, so it goes from roughly 0% maybe to 1%. If you just flip the label of this point in the, data, in the training set. If you optimize the same point, so now you start the attack, you optimize it with these gradients, you get this strange blurred image, which is a four, and then there is a sort of shape of zero in the background, and this is labeled as zero. So if you manage to inject this point with this label in the training set, the testing error of this classifier goes up to 20%. So this is uh, trained on 100 points, you have 784 features, and I mean, the impact of the attack depends on the, on the uh, specifics of the problem, so number of features, number of training samples, but in the end, this is a huge change uh, just by injecting one point out of, of 100, so it's less than 1%, okay? You can, of course, iterate, so you can uh, inject more attacks, and in this case, with less than 10%, you can reach roughly more than 30% error. In, the, in, the, in, this, in this problem at least. And we've made other experiments with other data sets. In some cases, uh, you, you have robustness. I mean, the system is robust enough. In some others, it's very vulnerable. It depends on, on the specific problem at hand. You can also um, counter this attack. And for poisoning, it's much, more, it's much easier to counter such attacks with, than the evasion ones. So for the evasion ones, I think for uh, a lot of problems, um, there's almost no hope. So it would be very difficult to find a robust classifier, especially if the attacker is very unconstrained. For the poisoning case, it's easier to defend against this attack because the nature of this attack is to inject outliers in the training set. If you inject a point which is similar to the other training points, you, you will never... Uh, obtain a significant change in the classification function. So to, in, to worsen the classification function, I have to inject points which are very different from the rest of the data. And so based on this observation, you can derive different defenses. Uh, there is one which is called, a family of such defenses is called data sanitization, where you essentially try to detect the outliers and remove them. Or you can also use robust learning algorithms based on principles from robust statistics where the, the algorithm knows that there may be some outliers in the data and its, uh, its learning process ignores them automatically, okay? We've developed uh, one of such algorithms recently and uh, <laughs> it's based on the trimmed mean statistics from, uh, from robust statistics, if you know it. And this was in a linear regression problem. So in this case, just to exemplify it, you have this cloud of blue points. Those are the legitimate ones. And then you have some outliers, which are circled in blue, okay? So this is the basic scenario on the, on the leftmost image. Now, ideally, we would like to learn this regression line, okay, perfectly aligned with the untainted, untainted point. It's a regression problem, one-dimensional regression problem. But what you learn, if you, if you apply the standard regression, is this line, okay? Which is completely, let's say, offset with respect to the untainted points because there are outliers there. So what Trim does is basically um, iteratively identify, trying to identify the outliers and remove them from the training set and then learn the regression line just using the remaining points. And, what you do is you start from initializing the outliers at random, 
Those are the red ones that you see here. And those are now excluded when learning the, the regression line, okay? So you, more or less you get the same line here because at iteration one, because you just remove a set of random points. But now what you can do is measure the loss of each point with respect to the line that you fit and exclude those which are farther away from the line. And then if you iterate in the end, you see that you can mostly detect uh, the outlying observations in your data, okay? And so, so you can recover more or less the ideal regression line. And then we tested these on different data sets and we, we found that uh, it works uh, fairly well. Uh, I think I'm not going to uh, discuss this and uh, I just want to quickly uh, try to conclude. So these were just two examples. So we've seen evasion attacks, which are adversarial examples, if you wish, and poisoning at the training phase. And uh, this is just a recap of all the attacks that you can envision if you follow the model that I presented at the very beginning. Okay, so if you intersect the attacker goal with the capability of the attacker, you got six possible slots. Some of them doesn't make any sense, but in some other you can find different attacks. For example, if you wish to compromise integrity, by manipulating the training data, which means I can now inject some samples, but I don't want to cause an error on all the test samples indiscriminately. I just want to focus on some specific points in your test set. That would cause just an integrity violation. And this is uh, encompassing all the category of attacks known as backdoors and uh, poisoning integrity attacks in general. Or there are attacks that you can craft to violate the privacy, which I'm not covering here, okay? I had an example on poisoning, on uh, backdoors, but I, I think we can, uh, we can skip it and leave maybe some time for question. And so you have the slide for reference. <clears throat> and so to conclude, um, this is a recent research field. I mean, it's just 10 years old, more or less. And uh, I hope I, 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 I showed you that there were mostly two parallel tracks, right? So, Earlier work was in the field of adversarial machine learning and more recent work boomed in the security of deep networks area. And I hope to have convinced you that there are intimate connections between the two areas. And uh, if you want to know more, I, I refer you to this, uh, to this paper that, I, as I said, we have um, written uh, together with this tutorial. Okay, so you can find a complete timeline in this paper and uh, that's all from, from my point of view, okay? Thank you.